Thank you for joining us around the fire. For more information or to make a donation, please visit randomactnetwork.com. Now, want to hear a scary story? Dr. Marilyn York was relocating her family from Park City, Wisconsin to West Plainfield, Texas, where she planned to open her own practice. She'd previously flown out with her husband, Roger, to view houses, closing on one shortly thereafter. Now, they packed the van and Roger set off for their new home with their two-year-old son, as Marilyn needed a few final days to wrap up with her patients. Before they left, they set a timer on the Polaroid camera and took two family photos in front of their former home, one for each of them. The photos captured the moment perfectly, the family excited for their new life. But they never made it, and Roger never called. Marilyn reached out to the police, and while they immediately began scanning their route for the license plate, she couldn't sit around worrying. She canceled all upcoming appointments, and a colleague, Henry, picked her up in his station wagon along with the rest of her belongings. They stopped at just about every diner, gas station, and rest stop that they passed, but no one recognized her family or their vehicle. Neither did anyone at the inns or motels. Hour after hour, stop after stop, the Polaroid photo never left Marilyn's grip. They didn't remember pulling off of the main highway, but they'd stopped seeing any road signs long ago, along with anywhere to stop. As the sun lowered in the sky, the pair began to worry. They were sure they'd see a gas station by now, but the endless darkness of the desert continued on forever. There were no other headlights or any lights at all, just a wall of black on the other side of the windows, except for the passing dirt visible in the dim headlights. Finally, they saw a large, hand-painted sign in the distance just off the road. Bender Inn, it said. Last stop for miles. Jerky, gas, rest. They felt unbelievably lucky. As they turned off the road, Marilyn wondered if her family may have been in the same situation, though their van didn't go through gas as quickly as Henry's station wagon. The dull shadow of an old barn came into view against the sky. On the side, in the same sloppy painting as the sign by the road, was written IN in dripping capital letters. There was one lone gas pump out front, below a dim, flickering orange light. Henry parked next to the pump, and Marilyn began grabbing a few things while he went to fill the tank. The nozzle coughed as he squeezed the trigger. He squeezed it again, and it clicked, but nothing came out. He hit the body of the pump with the palm of his hand, and a tinny echo rang out. They'd have to ask inside. Walking towards the door, Marilyn noted several cars parked around back of the building. They entered the windowless door into a low ceiling room with untreated, dirty wood floors and the immediate smell of must and body odor. There was a kitchen area on the left and a long table with a few clearly handmade crafts, seemingly from animal bones and feathers. On the right, a counter of dried goods and meats. Running the length of the entire room from floor to ceiling was a dirty burlap divider of some kind, like they'd split the back half of the room into another space. In front of the curtain was a dining set with six chairs. From around the back, an old woman entered the front, wiping her hands. She looked angry, but waved them in. The woman didn't speak any English, but she was used to communicating with travelers. Though, as hard as they tried to ask about the gas pump, she didn't understand. Eventually, they gave up, and she gestured that she was going to cook. The old woman began working in the small kitchen, and Marilyn and Henry were left to look around the place. A while had passed when the front door burst open. A large man entered, dirty and greasy and furious. He screamed about the car parked out front. Henry apologized and explained they needed gas. The old man laughed, spitting his tobacco onto the floor, and said it hadn't pissed up anything in 40 or 50 years. Baffled, Marilyn and Henry pleaded for any kind of assistance. Finally, he agreed to make a call about a gas delivery, but only if they moved their car around the side. Marilyn offered to do it as she wanted to grab a few more things from the car. Henry handed her the keys as the old woman began to set the table. A deep sigh escaped Marilyn the moment she sat in the driver's seat. She was so frustrated to be delayed and wanted to be anywhere but here. 
The tears came as she recalled her family's excitement only a few days ago. Now, her future looked as dark as the stains on the fabric inside. Marilyn backed the car away from the pump, pulling around the side of the building towards the other cars. Up close, it was more like a junkyard than a parking lot. Many of the cars were rusted or missing parts. Some looked ancient, nearly 20 or 30 years old. There were several vans and trucks and... Everything stopped. Directly in front of her sat her family's van. The license plate had been removed, but she was certain. She threw the car into park and hurtled towards the van, shoving her face up against the window and looking inside. The van, which had been filled to the brim with their belongings, was now nearly empty. Left behind was only garbage, a few random papers, and her son's teddy bear. A feeling of dread overtook her so heavily she nearly collapsed. Looking back at the ramshackle hotel, she remembered Henry alone inside. Returning to the station wagon, she grabbed her small pocket knife and a canister of bear spray, tucking them both into her pockets. For the first time in her life, she wished she'd owned a gun. Upon opening the door, she noticed a fresh presence in the room. A young, beautiful brunette who was shamelessly flirting with Henry. Hearing Marilyn return, Henry looked back with a huge grin. They were going to be the guests of honor, he said. He pulled the chair back from the head of the table and waited for her to sit. Marilyn wanted to grab him and run, but there was nowhere to go. She hated the idea of the dirty, smelly curtain hanging behind her. The young woman was Kate, a medium who gave lectures at colleges across the South. She introduced Big Daddy, who said nothing in return, and called the old woman Ma. She asked what Marilyn did for a living, and panicking, Marilyn said she was a teacher. How could you be a teacher, she asked, if you're already a full-time doctor? Marilyn's eyes shot to Henry. He nervously laughed, explaining he'd already shared how they knew each other. He looked at Marilyn like she was acting strange. She continued, apologizing. Sometimes she liked to create a new identity when she was on vacation, she said. Vacation, huh? Kate pestered again. So you're not looking for your missing family? If looks could kill, Henry would be dead on the floor. How the hell had he shared so much in such a small amount of time? Marilyn started to answer when Ma dropped a bowl loudly in front of her on the table. A puddle of murky, red-tinted broth filled the bottom, topped with chunks of fatty meats and mysterious vegetables. Big Daddy and Ma began feasting without saying a word. Marilyn watched as Henry lifted his fork and took a lump of gray meat between his lips, chewing and dripping grease down his chin. She didn't have an appetite, and she was baffled that Henry was so blind to how odd everything was around them. But there was something about Kate that was magnetic. She laughed at his jokes and played with his hair. He batted away the compliments in a way that begged for more, and she provided. She rested her hand on his nearest shoulder and stepped behind him. He took another bite as she began to massage his shoulders. You really are handsome, she said. A face like that doesn't come along often. He thanked her awkwardly. It's gonna look even better on my brother. The curtain behind Marilyn whipped open, and a giant mass of a man appeared with a broad wooden mallet. He brought it down directly on Marilyn's head. She collapsed lifeless to the floor. Before Henry could scream, Kate slit his throat with the knife in her hand, and he too fell to the wooden planks below. The monster with the mallet stepped back behind the curtain and pulled a large lever. A trap door opened behind Marilyn's seat, and her body rolled inside. He then dragged Henry's body over, pushing him through and landing with a splatter in the darkness below. Kate complimented her brother and embraced him, giving him a long, wet kiss. He grunted with excitement. Ma got up to clear the plates and mop the floors, while Big Daddy helped himself to Marilyn's untouched dinner. He stabbed a chunk of meat with his fork and smeared it through the blood on the table like steak sauce. Time passed. Maybe minutes, maybe hours. Marilyn woke up from the jolt of Henry's body being lifted off top of her where he had landed. Her head was throbbing and the air tasted like pennies. 
Though her vision was blurry, she watched the man as he set to work, now wearing a butcher's apron. He pulled a massive, rusty meat hook down from its chain and hoisted Henry up. In one slick move, he hooked the metal into Henry's back, releasing the body's full weight to dangle from the rafters. The butcher looked back at Marilyn, who had barely closed her eyes, pretending once again to be dead. She had only just now seen his face for the first time. He looked so familiar. She didn't open her eyes again after that. The noise was enough. The butcher pulled and twisted, accompanied by a chorus of slurping and squirting, even splattering across Marilyn's face at one point. She flinched so slightly, and the man looked at her again, but she was still. He crossed to a counter of tools below a small mirror on the wall, and Marilyn finally caught a clear glimpse of his face. Or rather, her husband's. The man was wearing a distorted, bent, hand-sewn mask made of Roger's own face. Grunting, the man walked off to the back of the room, and Marilyn heard a door open and close. She stood up, but fell back to the floor as her head throbbed with every beat of her heart. She took a deep breath and stood again, steadying herself on a table nearby. Her eyes focused on the contents of the table, and she saw what looked like a bowl made of a human skull, overflowing with bone fragments, hair, and fingernails. She pushed herself away from the table and walked to what was left of Henry, confirming that he had no pulse. The butcher had been harvesting his skin. Though she'd hoped for his sake that he was dead, she now had to accept that she was totally and utterly alone with the benders. The entire basement was filled with an inch or so of warm brown liquid. The space contained tables, boxes, and trunks of rusty hunting gear, and torture devices, knives, and machetes, bits and pieces of animals and human bodies. Working her way through the room, she hoped to find an alternate exit. But it was too late. She heard the door open. The butcher was coming back. Marilyn moved as quickly as she could, returning to where she'd come from and pretending once again to be a corpse. The man walked into the room with his most horrifying tool yet, a chainsaw. He pulled the cord and the chain revved to life. Carefully, the butcher began to remove Henry's legs. Taking advantage of the noise, Marilyn got up from the floor and began running, making it nearly to the door before he noticed. The man whipped around, flinging the chainsaw through the air, clashing into everything near him, and followed. Marilyn burst up a set of concrete stairs out of the basement and into a sun garden. She slammed the doors behind her and waited. Moments later, the man appeared, but Marilyn was prepared with her bear spray, blasting him directly in the eyes. He tumbled backwards down the stairs and she shut the doors once again, sprinting into the yard. Suddenly, she plunged several feet below into a pit of bones and rotting carcasses, a terrible brown mix of decomposition. She heard the doors open again and the chainsaw's engine. Marilyn pulled herself down into the rotting soup and allowed herself to drown in the decay. The man came to the edge of the pit and looked down. He rubbed his eyes and looked again. She was properly hidden, and he continued into the yard. She didn't move until the sounds had faded. After pulling herself out of the pit, she ran in the opposite direction of the man, careful not to bump into any of the other residents of the inn. She made her way through the trees and eventually came upon a small house. Without any other option, she knocked on the door, checking behind her that she wasn't being followed. A middle-aged blonde woman let her inside. Marilyn told her that there were killers nearby and that her husband and friend were both dead. The woman calmly listened and brewed Marilyn a cup of tea. But Marilyn didn't want tea. She wanted to use the phone. The woman didn't have a phone, she said, as they were too much trouble. Nor did she have a car or any way to get anywhere, not that there was anywhere to go. Marilyn grew frustrated, raising her voice and begging for any kind of assistance when... From the back of the house came the faint noise of a baby crying. At first, she thought she imagined it. Marilyn looked around the room, seeing nothing to indicate a child. And then she knew. 
the familiar cries were coming from her son. Marilyn stole for the back room, gaining on the door, but as she reached for the handle, it opened itself. The baby cried from deep inside the room, out of Marilyn's sight. Blocking the view was Ma, looking furious as ever. Marilyn backed towards the living room, now hoping to escape outside, when a phone rang from around the corner. She looked at the blonde woman, who smiled with a mostly toothless grin. You told me you didn't have a phone, she said. The woman looked like she could barely contain herself. Guess I forgot. She laughed as Ma answered the call, and Marilyn left the small house and returned to the woods. It was dusk and getting harder to see. Listening close, she could only hear the sounds of bugs and birds and maybe bats. She took a few quiet steps, keeping an eye on the shadows around her. Suddenly, the butcher was right behind her. Marilyn screamed and ran as the man followed, slicing and dicing through the air like he just couldn't wait to catch his prey. But being such a large man, he couldn't match Marilyn's speed. She cleared the woods and came upon a field she hadn't seen before, and in front of her a stream and a wooden fence. She stepped into the water and sank to her knees, barely able to continue forward. He was getting closer. She squished and squirmed and finally freed herself from the mud, pulling herself up the wooden fence and toppling through the middle boards. There was a road in the distance. The butcher leapt over the mud with one jump and gripped the top of the fence with his left hand. He attempted to hurdle over the top, but he didn't have the height, and instead he crashed through the boards and onto the ground, dropping the chainsaw. Unmanned, it spun around wildly, connecting with his ankle and nearly cutting his foot clean off. He howled and screamed from the ground. Marilyn reached the road and eventually was picked up by a passing driver and taken to the hospital. They sent a pair of troopers out to the Bender farm right away, at first unsure of her statement. Ma answered the door and indicated that she couldn't speak any English. The men pushed their way inside, but the bloody sheet had been taken down. There was a rug over the trap door. The floor was freshly mopped. A flirtatious Kate insisted that no one matching Marilyn's description had ever been by, but one of the cops pushed back, saying he saw her car on the side of the building. Ma began yelling that the men must leave, physically pushing them from the house. In an instant, she'd given away her mastery of the English language, as well as her true nature. But the benders weren't going down without a fight. Big Daddy appeared in the doorway, clubbing one of the officers with the hammer. Kate had her knife ready to go, but the second man was able to run from the house to his patrol car. He made a desperate call over the radio and grabbed the spare ammo for his gun. Straightening his aviators, he stepped back out of the car. The butcher had been lying under the vehicle, waiting, and used his toy to cut through the officer's legs. He fell to the ground, screaming in pain, as the butcher began to make his way out from underneath. Word spread quickly, and several members of the county joined the other troopers when they arrived, guns drawn. The sheriff offered to let them come out unharmed, but there was no movement from the house. He repeated himself, but once again, nothing. As he stepped forward, offering their last chance, a bullet came from the side of the building, piercing the man's skull and tossing his hat into the wind. From there, it was war. The mob shot and shot and shot at the house until most of them were out of bullets. The gunfire was returned at first, but not for long, giving them hope they'd taken out their targets. Someone tossed a Molotov cocktail through the battered open door, and the house erupted. From behind the structure came the roar of a van with all four members of the Bender family inside. They plowed into the vigilantes, with the butcher leaning out the side, attacking with the chainsaw. Only one trooper made it to his car fast enough to follow the van, but they looped around, faking him out, and he drove right into the pit behind the house. No one knows for sure what happened to them. The tracks disappeared and the van was never located. Men combed through every inch of the Bender property, but never found any trace of the blonde woman that Marilyn had mentioned, nor a young boy. The family was later held accountable for over 70 deaths. 
Substantial rewards were offered for any information, but no one ever came forward. The Benders had escaped the clutch of the law, returning to the dust of the desert. The Chainsaw Massacre Written and told by Brian Renaud Inspired by true events